Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, and welcome to another HR Today educational podcast. I'm Elliot Clark, the CEO of HRO Today. We publish HRO Today magazine, HRO Today EMEA magazine, and HRO Today APAC magazine, as well as the host of the HRO Today forum and topical conferences held around the world. Today, we're going to talk about recruitment resource outsourcing, hiring, and navigating the current COVID-19 crisis. Recruitment resource outsourcing, as we mentioned in one of our earlier podcasts, is a different model for acquiring talent acquisition services. And we've got one of the world leaders in providing this service, PeerPoint International, and their CEO, Miguel Terrazano, as our guest. And we're going to talk a lot about the options it may offer as companies are trying to figure out how to navigate the current crisis, how to right-size their hiring efforts, and how they're going to plan for the future. So Miguel, uh, prior to founding PeerPoint, was responsible for large-scale global hiring, rather, for Cisco, Siebel, and PeopleSoft. His initial business concept was to create a global sourcing and recruiting engine for the Fortune 500s. PeerPoint is now a 15-year-old company, and they're at the very epicenter of the Silicon Valley in the heart of the, the hardest community in the country to recruit, providing flexible recruiting offerings for companies in healthcare, medtech, fintech, pharma, and chemical industry. So, Miguel, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thanks, Elliot. Appreciate it. Thanks for the introduction. So, nice to be here. Great. Almost here. Virtually. Almost here. Yes, we're all virtual yeah, right now. Right. Right. You know, yeah. the, welcome to the virtual studio in the virtual world of virtual thanks. workplace. That's right. Well, you know, firstly, I want to give thanks to whomever we give thanks to for being here. Hopefully everybody's healthy. You know, it takes me back. Uh, I come from South America, as you very well know, and Elliot knows my story. But as a child and a teenager, I lived through, during a time of revolution, unfortunately. And oftentimes we would be quarantined, sometimes for a lot longer period, with the exception that they would shut off our water and our electricity. So every day I wake up and say, well, thank goodness that we have water and electricity, you know, and the television set and internet and all these wonderful things, refrigeration. Elliot, you know, you had mentioned, what is it that we can do to prepare for the future? And some people are optimistic. Some people are very pessimistic. I tend to be somewhere in the middle and it changes day by day. But what we all know down deep in our hearts is that we're going to get out of this and it's going to be really strong. And I'm already seeing a lot of pent up demand for what the future will hold. And we need to get ready for that explosion. I went through it as the CEO of this company. Now this will be my third time. And uh, having worked for American companies, both internationally as well as domestically, since the 1980s, I went through the you know, 87, 92, and, and then the year 2000. So this will be my sixth time. And you had mentioned, what is it that companies can do? One thing is to, I would say, right, never let go of your marketing dollars, you know, drive your marketing dollars. And this will be the best time to forge relationships with the people that you want to hire, you know, the candidates, as well as your prospects, whomever your client's going to be. This is the most opportunistic time. What I love about today is that we do have access to the internet and telephone, and through them, we can forge better relationships with the candidates that were so difficult to get a hold of as they were working in the field or sitting in their cubicles or in an office. They were oftentimes busy for the recruiters or the sourcers or whomever called them, the hiring managers. And what we've found is that now, since everybody's at home, we can have real great, wonderful dialogue with them, really good conversations and get to the nitty gritty and understand not only are they going to be a good technical fit, but also are they going to be a good cultural fit for the company, you know, test both for IQ and EQ. So this is the time that my company in particular, we're taking a step back, retooling, and really looking to forge great relationships with thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of candidates for all our clients, both domestically and internationally. Well, you know, really good point about, you know, there's an availability to help build the talent pool right now. And, you know, when you think about, you know, a lot of companies are making painful decisions about what they're going to do with their talent acquisition infrastructure. And we're certainly seeing the unemployment numbers skyrocket and hiring is, of course, suspended. But the RRO model has some advantages on both the downswing and the upswing. And I thought it'd be a good time to sort of look at that as one of the options companies can think about. So in this uncertain environment, what are the advantages of the recruitment resource outsourcing product versus, yeah. you know, some of the other internal and external recruitment options? 
right now, companies, of course, you know, we're going to be either furloughing or parting ways with some of our infrastructure, some of our human resources infrastructure all across the board and talent acquisition. When things come back to normalcy, it's going to be challenging to refresh and restart again. So oftentimes our customers bring us in as high octane. I put octane in your tank. We are a red light, green light organization. So we come in without a long-term contractual agreement. We come with a fully loaded tool belt of all the tools imaginable. And you turn us on today and we're off to the races tomorrow. So if in fact, let's assume today you had 10 recruiters in your organization and two months down the line, we realized that we have three times as many requisitions as we thought we were going to have. And it's a code red. We need to act on these yesterday. Customers will bring us in to make up for that. So it's our flex. And uh, we able to come in and be that extra hand to get us to that, to meet those objectives that sometimes come before we know it. We could be out of this next month, it could be two months, it could be next week. But to have a partner that will be able to step in and work alongside your current infrastructure, as depleted as it may be, on a one-on-one relationship is crucial to addressing the pent-up demand that I know we're all going to see across you know, every single industry in the United States and, and abroad. I think it's a great point and uh, you know the pent-up demand and even now if you think about it as companies are downsizing they may be cutting back on recruiting talent and there'll still yeah. be oscillations where they can turn part of their recruiting team into a to variable versus fixed cost using these kinds of service options are you starting to i mean it's probably early but in your prior experiences whether it was the great recession in 2008 or uh, after 9-11 have you seen that happen where companies have said okay, you know, I have 10 recruiters, painful as it is, I have to drop to six, but they'll sporadically fill in for that smaller team when they have the smaller oscillations before pent-up demand with flexible resource models versus fixed models. Absolutely. Uh, So much so that we are the bellwether because we're the first to go. You know, we're the external vendor. We're a variable cost and we're not on long-term contractual agreements, unlike RPOs that may want to strike a one, two, three-year agreement. We're basically, turn us on today and tomorrow we're gone uh, with a 15-day leeway. So we're the very first to be cut. And I'm feeling the pinch right now, of course. But we're also the first to come back because what ends up happening is we variable cost vendors are the first to go. And then ultimately that bleeds into the fixed cost of W-2 employees or the internal uh, contractors. And then once the floodgates open, we're the first to come back because we're the easiest to onboard. So to your question, I've seen it done through the last five recessions or you know economic downturns. We are somewhat of the bellwether. I, in the past three weeks, probably turned down the spigot by 35, 40%, but I'm retooling, as I said, those 35, 40% resources to reach out to all our clients, candidates, and build a more robust database to get ready. We're basically stocking up the nuts for the winter. And then once the floodgates open, we'll have a very robust database of candidates that will have already been vetted. So we won't have to reinvent the wheel and compete against time. Because once the floodgates open up, then everybody is going to be clamoring for those human resources, regardless of the industry. And those people are going to be in high demand, A, and B. It's going to be tougher and tougher to get a hold of them and have meaningful dialogue with them. Give you some idea, like from a, a deployment perspective, you know, going into whether internal hiring takes a few months to hire and onboard someone, the recruitment process, outsourcing implementation times vary between 90 and 180 days, depending on complexity. How long does it take for if someone calls you tomorrow and says, Miguel, I need three recruiters, four recruiters, if, when the pent up demand, you know, and they call and they say, I need 30 recruiters, and you and I both have lived through this, you know, when they, they make that call, how long is it? take for you to have a team at the client's disposal working for them filling jobs? What's your time to deploy look like? Yeah, it all depends on the um, project, the customer, the geography, the function. But I'll give you a very specific a call from yesterday. I have a new customer uh, in the medical device world that need to expand their operations as everyone is worldwide in Brazil, Romania, United Kingdom, and California. Okay. And they need a team. Well, we have currently about 200 people on our staff, most of them W-2 employees. And then we have an ecosystem of contractors that have worked for us in the past, both domestically and internationally for the past 15 years. So this particular team tomorrow, with the exception of Romania, I'm able to fill Brazil, California, and UK 
day after tomorrow. So by, let's just call it Monday, they're up and running. The short is typically within 48 hours, we'll have the team deployed and ready for action. They're all tool ready, right? Their tool belts come fully loaded. So let's assume we need to address a Germanic need. We will have the tools necessary to address that Germanic need. Or let's assume it's Argentina or Brazil, New York, Idaho, or California, Singapore. We're ready to deploy at a moment's notice. And to your question, if you take the average of you know 15,000 hires a year, which is about what we do, 48 to 72 hours would be the yeah. average. Well, that's great. So for our listeners, I know many of you in the HR community are tied up with managing layoffs, employee communication to those employees you want to retain, and also trying to plan for the future and engage the people that you have. But one of the things I know everyone is facing as well is how to manage their TA strategy. So really what we wanted to convey is that there are many different alternatives. This is one of them, and it has the advantages, Miguel said, of being easy to engage and deploy both you're going to turn part of your operation into a virtual workforce using external resources or when that pent-up demand hits. And Miguel, you talked about the pent-up demand. Many folks are anticipating this V-shaped recovery. As Mm -hmm. you look at this, based on your prior experience, I mean, do you find the the companies are well prepared for that or are they usually caught behind the curve when the market swings around? This is a broad stroke, Elliot. I mean, it's a loaded question, right? And I haven't, of course, had a conversation with all our clients, but just based on past experience, and I'm not going to, please don't quote me on today. I'm sure some of my clients or people outside my ecosystem are prepared, but from my vantage point, 90% are not prepared. And that's just human nature. You know, as human beings, we just don't prepare. I mean, we've prepared. Yes, we've hoarded toilet paper and we've hoarded spaghetti and prego sauce. But in terms of our non-personal life and our corporate, and, and I'm talking companies from small companies with 30 employees to, you know, the large ones, right? The Fortune 50s and everything in between, I would say 90% not prepared. Well, I promise I, should... I won't quote you on that. I'll I'll, I'll keep it just between me and <laughs> 180,000 subscribers, okay? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but, you know, it is true, and, and I'll chime in with you, that most companies, 90% are not prepared, and a lot of them just can't be because the hiring managers don't have a good handle on their workforce planning, which is a continuing headache right. for everyone in the talent acquisition profession. But some great points that you've made about where things are and love the perspective of someone who's been through a number of these and run a company that has continued to survive and thrive both through the lean times and the boom times. I want to thank Miguel Terrazano, the CEO of PeerPoint, and we appreciate all of our listeners, your time and attention. hope this additional alternative and option is one that you consider as you look at what your future plans will be and that the content of this is helpful to you at this time. I'm Ellie Clark, the CEO of HRO Today. Thank you for listening. We look forward to you joining our next HRO Today educational podcast.